little easy steps. Hope you guys are having a fantastic evening. Um, or it's probably not evening for you. It's evening for me. But anyways, so today in 4.13, in the practice of statistics, we're going to talk about what can go wrong when you're sampling. Um, we're also going to talk about um, basically why random sampling allows us to make assumptions or inferences or generalizations about the population, um, even though they're just like many pieces of the population. Um, and so in order to do that, the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to look at an applet. Um, I usually do this as an experiment in class, um, but I think you'll get kind of the same idea from this applet. So um, I'm using Rossman Chance, which is um, a really awesome website. They have a lot of different statistical uh, applets, um, just a lot of good visuals, super awesome. So basically what we're going to do um, is here I can set, I have like a candy machine, like Reese's Pieces, um, and I can set the probability of orange. So let's set the probability of orange to be um, 0.3, which means there's other colors in there, and those other colors make up 70%. Um, so there's 30% orange. Um, and my sample is going to be size 5, and I'm just going to take one sample um, and animate so you can kind of see the, the idea. So this p hat here that they show you, that's actually going to be the proportion of oranges in the sample that you took. So we're going to draw an, a sample, and we have one orange and then four not oranges. So that's a p hat of 0.2. So this is not exactly... 0.3, but it's reasonably close. So let's do it again. Okay, this one we didn't get any oranges, um, so our p hat is zero. We do it again. Okay, now we're at 0.4. So as you see, we've kind of gotten like a couple, most of our values were 0, 0.2, and 0.4. All are kind of close to 0.3. Um, and so if I kept doing this, you know, you'd get a lot of variation just because with sampling you get variation. Um, you're never, you are rarely ever going to get exactly what the true proportion of oranges is. However, let, if we increase this to like say 25, do, 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 do. I should probably stop the animation, but um, <clears throat> we got four oranges and then the rest, so 21 non-oranges. So that p hat was 0.16. Um, let's skip the animate for a second here and uh, bump that up to 50. And you end up with a sample that actually got you exactly 30%, which is what is the true um, proportion of oranges in that sample. Now the next one may or may not be 30. Okay, 36. 16, that's pretty far away from 30, 0.26. Okay, so as you kind of look, okay, maybe we make our sample size 500. Whoa, oh my God, I might be breaking the machine here. It's a lot. Okay, 0.328, right? Pretty close to 0.3. And so kind of what you see with this is that the larger and larger your sample is, the closer your sample proportion or value that you're looking at, your statistic, which we haven't learned yet, but you'll learn later, um, is getting closer and closer to the, the probability, the true proportion um, that exists in this candy box. Okay, so basically the idea is if you randomly sample, um, your sample is going to be pretty, most of the time, is going to be pretty representative of, um, of the population. And the larger your sample size is, the closer, the more likely it is that your sample is going to be close. Like it's going to get closer and closer and closer to the true value um, the larger your sample size gets. Okay, so um, just a little demo for you there. Thanks, Rossman Chance. Okay, 
So there you have it. So um, random sampling allows us to make inferences about the population because of two things. One is samples don't vary tremendously from sample to sample. Um, and then the second reason is that basic probability laws uh, allow us to trust the sample. Um, uh, that the sample is going to be close to what the population is. Um, as long as randomness occurs, you, this will absolutely not be true if you don't use randomness, because uh, then probability laws don't apply. Okay. Sometimes, even if you think you're doing everything right, and you've done your randomness, and you've designed your experiment or your observational study well, um, you can still have things happen that just are not ideal um, when choosing a sample. So um, some of these you can avoid, and it depends on the situation. Um, and then others, there's not a whole lot you can do about. So the first is um, when some groups are left out of the sample, and that's called under coverage. It's basically like you don't cover everybody. Um, this is something that you can work on, like you have a little control with sometimes. Um, a good example of this would be um, doing a phone survey. Um, you would miss anybody whose phone number isn't registered or who doesn't have a phone. Um, you could also get under coverage if um, you do like a door-to-door -door survey um, and you walk up to someone's house and you knock on the door and um, you ask them questions. Uh, that is under coverage as well because you are missing people who don't have homes um, or people maybe who are working, uh, but that's more the next situation. Um, so that's, that's under coverage. You could also have uh, someone not respond um, or refuse to answer. Uh, this happens a lot because people don't typically like to answer surveys. Um, and so a lot of times if people get calls and are asked, hey, can you take this quick survey? Um, usually the response is click. Um, I guess nowadays it's click, but you know, you hang up uh, and you know, you can't really do a whole lot, a whole lot about that. Um, or maybe you can't contact them, you call, and they just don't pick up, they don't respond. Um, so that is, um, that is non-response bias. Um, and the thing is, unfortunately, when you get under coverage or non-response bias, um, you're actually leaving out a certain type of person. Um, so all of the information you gather is from people who are willing to take surveys. And this is not the case if you have someone, uh, if you have multiple people hang up, um, all of those people have something in common. And so that tends to cause issues for your for the results of your, of your study. And the last thing is, if you go up to somebody and you say, and you know, you're asking maybe like a touchy subject, like how do you feel about abortion or um, do you text and drive or, you know, things that may not be legal. Do you smoke pot? Do you drink? Um, those things can often get results where people are lying or they're stretching the truth a little bit. Um, and other things that might happen, um, would be like if the surveyor is, a pregnant woman and they're asking about abortion. Um, that could strongly influence the person's response. Um, if you have, um, I don't know, s certain characteristics of the person surveying, um, you know, if you ask about underage drinking and you're a teenager, uh, you might have a different response than if you were an adult asking the same question. Um, so this most often occurs when you're asking in person um, and the person has to respond uh, or they have to put their name on it so it's you get slightly better results if you um, make things anonymous uh, so that is called response bias because they're biased your the result is actually biased because of the way that they're responding 
something else that could affect the response bias that I, I did not mention is um, the wording and order of questions can also affect how people respond to things. So for example, um, if you take a look at, at the following examples, uh, the first question is, if I, if I were to ask you, how many dates did you have last month? And you tell me, mm, zero. And then the next question is, how happy are you life with your uh, how happy are you with your life in general on a scale of one to ten? If I have subsequently reminded you that you haven't had any dates, and then asked you how happy your life you are with your life, that could actually affect how you respond. And you're you actually you know might generally be happy with your life, but you were just reminded about how many that you didn't have any dates last month. Um, and if you had flipped the questions and you said, hey, how happy are you with your life in general? The answer on 1 to 10. You may or may not at all be thinking about your romantic life. Um, and then you can ask the question about the dates and then you have two separate results. Um, number two, uh, should illegal immigrants be prosecuted and deported for being in the US illegally or shouldn't they? Um, is a question that like is worded in a certain direction. Um, so using the term illegal immigrants um, and prosecuted and deported, all of those are super negative terms. Um, so you're going to tend to get more negative uh, results. Um, and uh, and then you know if you look at the fourth problem or the fourth fourth example that says should illegal immigrants who have worked in the US for two years be given the chance to keep their jobs and eventually apply for legal status both question two and four are asking the same thing um, is should undocumented uh, immigrants uh, be deported or should they stay in the US um, and but they're worded very very differently and this one like is like oh yeah you know they're working hard and they've been working for two years like should they be able to eventually apply for legal status you're going to tend to lean um maybe not you but you know the general public uh most often will lean towards the positive side where um yes oh yeah of course they should you know they've been working really hard um and in this case you're going to tend to say yeah they should probably be deported they're not here legally um and three uh, is always my favorite um, to talk about because um, are you pro-abortion or against abortion? Um, this is a question that, uh, depending on the results that you want to get, you could word it a lot of different ways. If you ask somebody if they are against abortion or pro-abortion, um, you're not really asking the, the true debate, which is pro-life or pro-choice. Um, Pro-lifers believe that um, everybody has a right to life and um, women should not have the ability to choose. And then people who are pro-choice tend to believe that, um, you know, women should choose to do with her body what she wishes. Um, but the way that this question is worded um, is asking, are you pro-abortion? Um, and even people who are pro-choice I would make a safe assumption that they don't actually, uh, they're not pro-abortion. They're not saying, yeah, let's go kill babies. Like, that's an awesome thing to do. That is not at all what pro-life people believe. Um, they just believe that women have the right to choose. Um, but they are not pro-abortion, right? It's a very different question. Um, and so depending on the results that you want, you can word questions in a way that get wording to lean one direction or the other. Now, if you asked um, in number three, if instead of are you pro or against abortion, you asked are you um, pro-choice or do you believe that a woman doesn't have the right to do what she wants with her body, uh, that would tend to lean you the other direction. Um, and so you, what you really want to do as a good statistician is avoid biased questions, avoid questions that would like lean people in a certain direction. So in this case, are you pro or against abortion? A better way to say that would be something like, are you pro-life or are you pro-choice? Or just leave it an open question and say, how do you feel about abortion? And then let people 
respond in a way that they wish. Um, so anyways, this is super important. Um, you'll see it in the news, you'll see it in the media, kind of everywhere. All right, great job.